There are tons of things that I don't enjoy in this bundle. <laughs> Hello friends, my name is Brandon Dayton. I'm your humble narrator. Welcome back to another bundle banter. That's right. It's that time of the month. Humble's rolling back around with that humble choice September 2020. And compared to the fantastic offerings that we had last month, this is uh, just a dumpster fire, dude. I really did not find anything worth playing for an extended period in this bundle. Uh, there are some very positively rated games that I'm sure some people will like, but I just didn't get a lot of them, I think. This was not a bundle that was made for me in any sort of way. And of course, there's also a few games that I've seen bundled before, gone pretty cheap, so... I don't know, man. I was having high hopes after last month, but this month they definitely fell off. Ugh. What are you doing, Humble? Anyways, let's let's take a look at the games and see what we got here. We've got Forager, Golf with Your Friends, Strange Brigade, Lethal League Blaze, Generation Zero, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, The Occupation, Catherine Classic, Vampire the Masquerade, Coteries of New York, The Shapeshifting Detective, Evo Land, and Fun with Ragdolls. I will say right off the bat that all of these games have uh, their share of problems. There's probably only two games in here that I could call passable. Uh, everything else just didn't ring any sort of bell with me. So overall, super, super disappointing bundle, although uh, I'm sure there are some people out there that will disagree. That's fine. Anyways, let's jump into the games, break them down piece by piece, and see what we got here. Forager. I love a game that isn't scared to soak up hours with grinding for this or that, and Forager does exactly that, but it has a hard time masking the fact that it's essentially just a glorified cookie clicker. The longer you play, the more options and depth the game will reveal, but getting past the initial stage of just clicking things to build other things so you can click even more things, it's just a really hard sell for me. It's one of the best cookie clicker games that I've played, but if I wanted to play a cookie clicker game, then I would boot one up on my phone. There are nice laid back graphics, which makes getting into the game easier, but as much as I love seeing numbers turn into bigger numbers, I just can't help but feel that I'd like Forger to be spiced up with just a bit more challenge. Forger is a relaxing game that won't tax your brain, but because of this, I felt extremely bored. You might think, hey, at least it's a nice low-spec game that I could play on like a potato netbook or something, but it even fails at that. For as simple as it is, it is extremely bloated, and my rig experienced some serious slowdown when the screen was filled with buildings. People do seem to like this title, as I've said, but personally, I had such a hard time squeezing any sort of enjoyment out of this stone. Maybe it's just the kind of game that wasn't made for me. Well, that's fine. The smooth brains can have it. Golf with your friends. Did you ever want to play with your friends' balls? Well, I don't want to hear about it. We have a don't ask, don't tell policy here at Dayton Does. Golf with your friends is definitively the best golf game that I've played. Although that might just say more about the sorry state of golfing games than it does about whether or not golf with your friends is a game worthy of your time. Overall, there are some interesting ideas. And if you turn ball collision on, then you're guaranteed to throw a big ol' monkey wrench into even your most solid friendships. And not just because balls are touching. <laughs> I do think that this is a decent title. I mean, it managed to suck me in for a few hours. If you're looking for a simulator, then move right past this one. If you're just looking for a fun with physics sort of game, well, it kind of fails on that front as well. I was not very impressed by golf with your friends. I had the ball bouncing off of invisible walls and clipping through platforms and basically anything else that moved, and all this started working the janky camera around until the point that I was pretty sure that I was just stuck in a seizure simulator. There are some good ideas with plenty of difficulty options and the like, but it needs so much more polish that I'd be remiss to recommend this to even the most avid golfing fan. Again, it seems to be a popular title, but it has far more problems than I'm willing to deal with just to get my daily dose of jank. I guess it's time to boot up Goat Simulator again and show them how it's done. Strange Brigade. Killing zombies? Pfft. 
stereotypical, expected, unsurprising, killing mummies, thinks outside the box, allows you to desecrate history, and they make their own confetti when you unleash a flood of lead upon them. And this game doesn't limit it to just strictly mummies either. Did you ever want to blast a minotaur in the face with a musket? I mean, personally, I had no idea that that was something I wanted, but Strange Brigade brought me just that, with great graphics and sound work that really puts you in the fight. Choose from four adventurers, each with their own abilities. You can roll solo, or you can bring the whole squad. After all, four guns are far better than one. This is not a long game. There are nine levels, which you can wrap up in less than two hours. They did try to extend the replayability a bit with high score and survival modes, but it just doesn't have the same punch as the campaign. You can scoop up some of the DLC if you're really thirsty to harvest the blood of more mythical creatures, but I'm not overly tempted to do so. Strange Brigade came in with a bang and was over before monotony started to settle in. I'll probably let this one linger on my PC for a while, so a few more months down the road, I can whip it out again once I've forgotten the levels a bit and relive the glory once more. This is uh, one of our monthly loud and dumb games, which of course means that it is one of the two favorites in this bundle. So, wonderfully done, Strange Brigade. Great ideas, fantastic execution. Is everybody taking notes on this? All these other games need to take some notes. <laughs> Lethal League Blaze. Team Reptile hasn't made very many games, but the ones that they have gotten to market are always a fantastic time. I played through Megabyte Punch way back in the infancy of my channel. And then when Lethal League showed up, I was so excited the Team Reptile came out with a new game that I attempted to get a key. But they didn't even want to talk to a channel that, at the time, was only around 200 subscribers. I mean, I don't blame them, I guess. But it does demonstrate a little something about their business model. And this interaction, or lack thereof, did make me decide that I would not be giving them any more exposure than I already had with Megabyte Punch. But I guess Humble is going to force my hand here. So here it goes. Lethal League is a shallow game. It touts itself as being easy to play and difficult to master, but my experience was more along the lines of mashing the swing button until something connects with the ball. It might be fun to play with friends. I wouldn't know because everyone in the Philippines exclusively plays Dota. I can, however, confirm that the netcode is a dumpster fire. High ping is a great advantage, and considering I'm in the Philippines, I win. A lot. But it never feels like I did it through skill. I just used my latency to assist in cheesing the timing of the swing. Maybe there is a skill curve but I couldn't trudge the shallow waters of Lethal League long enough to gauge it. The 2.5D graphics and banger soundtrack are perhaps the only reasons that I could be encouraged to bother booting up Lethal League again. While Lethal League Blaze is better than Lethal League, I, I don't know if it can be fully justified as a new game. And as I've already said, my past interactions with Team Reptile have uh, already put a bad taste in my mouth, so take all of this with a grain of salt, as usual. Generation Zero. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and put it out here that this game has more than its fair share of problems. We'll get into that. But despite all the troubles yet to be ironed out, I really, really like Generation Zero. Maybe it's the constant nods to the 1980s, maybe it's gunning down robots with extreme prejudice, but most likely I think that it's the brutal struggle to survive that gets me amped. As you may know by now, I love a game that isn't scared to kick players in the dick once in a while. Most deaths do feel justified. Oh, you picked a fight with the wrong robot. Now you're going to spend your final seconds crouched behind the counter trying to reload your shotgun while you're slowly surrounded by metal death machines. It is awesome! <laughs> but there are also moments that the game reminds me that it's way too big for its britches. I appreciate that the devs tried to create such an expansive game, but Sometimes smaller really is the way to go. Generation Zero has graphical glitches, you'll get stuck on some objects, the number of inaccessible buildings is far too large, and there are absolutely no NPCs to interact with, aside from the robots that you're gunning down. 
It is a great game if you're just looking to feel like a leather jacketed badass that stepped out of the 80s ready to transform Robux into hunks of scrap, but if you're looking for a deeper experience, like Rust, it's not that. Yet, it could get there, and I really hope it does, but only time will tell. Ukulele in the Impossible Lair. This was supposed to be Donkey Kong for a new generation. And it does fairly well at that goal. The game is cute and fun and colorful, and I have to be at least a little bit excited for a new actual platformer mascot to rise. There is of course the small rub about Platonic removing John Jafari's voice from the first iteration after some feigned SJW outrage, but putting that bit of drama aside, that was a game that did well enough to warrant a sequel. And The Impossible Lair is a fine follow-up. I really like the fact that the overworld map has far-reaching effects within the actual levels, but while the game is put together well, the difficulty leaves a lot to be desired. Old school Donkey Kong was super difficult, so I guess new school Donkey Kong for a new generation has to hold your hand just a little bit too much, because that's the state of gaming that we're at, I suppose. The entire game feels like a cakewalk until you get into the impossible lair. It feels like there should be like more of a climb in difficulty leading to the last challenges that you'll face. The entire game sticks around a difficulty of like 5 out of 10. But then the last stage is like, oh here you go, 12 out of 10. What the fuck? It doesn't feel like you're given the tools to complete the game without copious amounts of trial and error on the last level. Most of your playtime will be spent in the impossible lair, and compared to the rest of the game, it really does feel fucking impossible. That isn't a good thing. But aside from smoothing out the difficulty curve, uh, I guess it's a pretty decent game. The Occupation. This is a strange animal. You play as an investigative reporter, but instead of doing things like a reporter might actually do, like talking to people, you decide to just break and enter to get the information you need. Avoid the single guard, and get the info, which you will then reveal to the officials of the organization that you just stole from during some dialogue. And everyone's okay with this? They don't think twice about this confidential information being unveiled for the most part, and even if they actually do, you're still just allowed to roam even more high security buildings. While the story itself is serviceable, individual plot points like I just mentioned tend to niggle me into just completely checking out of the story. While the occupation serves as a decent stealth game, the story is only just slightly below par, but it'll still probably be enough to pull you through to the end of the game. Maybe? <laughs> there are a ton of side objectives, and of course, a timer. Why do devs put a timer in a game? This is supposed to be my adventure, not yours, asshole. <laughs> this is the sort of thing that makes me believe that the developers have very little respect for the agency of the player. I understand that a story needs to be told, but I'd at least like to be given the illusion that my choices matter just a little bit. The occupation isn't a total turd, but I would say that it is in the lower tiers of this choice bundle. Catherine Classic. What's the deal with puzzle games trying to rack up a few extra sales via sexuality? To be fair, this game is a hell of a lot better than something like Honey Pop. Characters and lore are actually a joy to uncover here. The narrative of the game focuses on lies and deceit and a deep-seated fear of commitment. As a married man with two kids, I can't say that I completely understand the whole fear of commitment line that tends to get regurgitated at every turn, but I will say that these themes are quite nicely illustrated in Catherine Classic. I definitely didn't expect to enjoy this game as much as I did. It's a complex and mature game that throws intense depressive themes right into your face. Oh yeah, I mean there's also an actual game part of this game which is about climbing boxes as fast as possible. And even that part does decently to keep things moving along, but if you couldn't tell quite yet, the characters in the story are the heart and soul of Catherine Classic. It is a very strange game, but I think that also gives it a lot of personality. I'm super into quirky games, as you might remember from my singing the praises of that playism bundle, and while I wouldn't rate Catherine Classic in the top three of my favorite picks out of this bundle, 
It's definitely nearer the top than most of these other titles. Vampire the Masquerade, Coteries of New York. What a title. Remember how great I said Vampire was last month? Well, this vampire game is the inverse of that one. I'm already extremely skeptical of visual novels since, for the most part, I could get a much better experience simply by reading an actual book and doing away with the ritual of pointing and clicking my way through the story. Vampire the Masquerade is no exception. One of the main reasons to play a visual novel over just reading a book is the addition of music and artwork. But Vampire tends to recycle art assets and music ad nauseum, to the point that this game feels just the slightest bit cash grabby. Draw Distance has made some decent games, but this game, their most recent game, is absolutely the bottom of the barrel compared to what they've made in the past. What the hell happened at that studio? The story is passable if you're only looking for insights on the four supporting characters, but I seem to have this crazy idea that the character I'm playing should be more than just a fucking cardboard cutout. All of this criticism is not even to mention the disappointing ending and the menagerie of game-breaking bugs that you'll encounter. They can do anything from prematurely ending a day to skipping entire chapters of the game. I mean, honestly, how hard is it to program a visual novel? If you can't do this, then you should probably give up game dev. And it might seem brutal, but I'm being honest. There are not even any moving parts here, dude. This is by far the worst game in the bundle. Objectively, I hate it. Stay away from it. Ugh, <sighs> the shape-shifting detective. You play as Sam! And if you couldn't tell from the title of the game, he is a shape-shifting detective! Dude can literally transform into anyone that he meets, which is pretty cool. This is like a shockingly interesting concept for a game, but it's done in an FMV style? Which is probably the worst choice that could have been made. I mean, there's a reason that FMV games ended up going the way of the dinosaurs. It is an extremely limited format, and for a game where you're supposed to be able to transform yourself into whoever you like, you really start to feel how restrictive everything is. I think the only modern FMV game that I played and even partially enjoyed was Her Story, and that was a game about scrubbing through video footage, so the format made perfect sense and kept me sucked in. For a game like this, the decision to go with FMV is fucking baffling. The actors that they used are floppy donkey dick terrible. I used to edit student films at the New York Film Academy, so I've seen my fair share of overacting amateurs, but this game puts all of them to shame. Even if the actors were completely flawless, the story itself is short and linear and overall just weak. Not worth a replay. Unless you enjoy a series of lecherous women trying to sleep with the main character for no discernible reason aside from the fact that, hey, sex sells. This game is an absolute disappointment and only slightly better than Vampire the Masquerade. I will not be wasting my time revisiting this. Evoland. The concept of Evoland is very cool, but the execution, oh god. The execution is so flawed. I enjoyed watching the game evolve as the party levels up, but that's really like the only actual hook to this game. I can tell that the developers like RPGs, at least from an aesthetic perspective, but playing Evoland seriously makes me wonder if the devs have ever actually sat down and played an RPG themselves. It is impressive how many times they managed to drop the ball. I don't think they did anything right in this game aside from the graphics. It is just a train wreck. They should put this game in a time capsule for future game devs to learn how never to develop a game. Okay, what makes it so bad, alright? Well, let's just start with the turn-based battles being one of the worst and most boring experiences that I've ever had outside of World of Warcraft. You have two party members. One guy attacks, the other guy heals both characters. Every turn. There is no strategy whatsoever, which goes directly against what makes a good RPG. 
even old RPGs. It's no excuse. Have you ever sat down to play the original Final Fantasy? It was grindy as shit, but it managed to be engaging the entire time. Even the puzzles in Evo Land are an absolute snooze. It feels like the entire game was made specifically for someone who had never gotten into RPGs, which is an awful idea, mostly because the vast majority of people who might consider this game will probably be hardcore RPG fans interested in the history of RPGs. Ugh. Well, I have to admit that the idea itself is interesting. The execution ugh, falls directly on its face right out of the gate. It might be worth a trip through just to see the evolution of RPGs, I guess, but don't expect to have any fun while you're there. Fun with Ragdolls, our final game. Hey, do you guys remember Kick the Buddy? I think that's what it's called. It was a Flash game, and now it's a phone app. Well, Fun with Ragdolls is essentially the same thing, except taking place in three dimensions. Alright, it's a bit unfair. It does much better at allowing for creativity, but that's about all there is to it. It's not much of a game at all. It's a sandbox with ragdolls. You can shoot them out of a cannon, hit them with a car, kill the ragdolls in as many ways as you can imagine, and then what? And then you sit around and wait for a fucking update. It's essentially Gary's Mod with much less graphical appeal. While well, the game might look like trash, I do have to admit that it runs pretty smooth and the physics are done quite well, but how much fun can you actually have just sitting in a fucking sandbox by yourself? It's boring. There is so much work to be done before I would give this game even a second look. Online multiplayer and workshop content could take this game to the stars, increasing the replay value of fun with ragdolls basically infinitely. But who knows how long we'll be waiting for that to become a real possibility. There are literally tons of better sandbox games out there. I don't understand what the appeal is supposed to be here. There are plenty of items and options to fiddle with, but I highly doubt that you will get more than an hour or two out of this title, at least until some more bits and bobs are added. So what do I think of this bundle? I think that I just took a shit on every game except for maybe three or four of them. And in a bundle that features 12 games, that's, that's not a good ratio. I do not approve. I'd highly suggest that everyone give this one the old skip a -roo, but in the Discord it seems like some people were excited for it, so, you know, what do I know? I'll just say that this is not within my tastes personally. In the, in the decent tier of things I like, in first place, Strange Brigade, really, really nice. Second place, Generation Zero, also super nice. In the less than my favorite, but still good, uh, I'd give third place to Ukulele, fourth place to Catherine Classic. In the somewhat neutral tier, I suppose we'd go with Forager, Golf with Your Friends, Lethal League Blaze. And then in the, in the fairly shit, I don't know why this exists here, we've got Fun with Ragdolls, The Occupation, uh, The Shapeshifting Detective, Evil Land, and Vampire the Masquerade. So with it all spelled out like that, there are tons of things that I don't enjoy in this bundle. Which is unusual, because I think that my gaming tastes are, are pretty wide, you know. I'm open to a lot of things, but I don't know, man. This this just rubbed me the wrong way. I would highly encourage you to skip this bundle. I will be skipping this bundle. Some things do tempt me, but, I mean, overall... <laughs> do I want to take all of the trash that goes along with it? You know what I mean? If you find a gold bar in a trash bag, are you going to just take the gold bar out or are you going to take home the whole trash bag, right? You get me. I don't want to stain my library with Vampire the Masquerade, okay? Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, friends, I hope that you like, comment, and or subscribe. If you did enjoy this episode, let me know what you think of the bundle. I'm very disappointed in it, but I, I seem to be in the minority. So let's open up a lively debate, shall we? <laughs> and once you're done doing all the YouTube-y likey things, you could also click some links in the description if you want. We've got links to Twitter, Discord, and Patreon. And as always, I'd like to give a big, big shout out to my beautiful patrons. Just Austin, Robert Waits, Dot Nathan, Crimson Albedo, Lady Nix, Rad and Missisco, and the OG, Nico the Legend. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you can support on the Patreon, it would be massively appreciated. We've got some pretty cool rewards. 
I read voice lines and such. I want to start setting up some streams and things. There are plenty of good ideas. But anyways, friends, I appreciate you joining me for another bundle banter. I hope that it won't be an entire month till I get to make another one. But these two take some time, you know. Gotta gotta test some stuff, sit down, write it out, render it up. It's it's a process, you know. But I will try to do better at making some content on this channel for you guys. There's also, you know, content on Red X, which does happen. So check me out over there if you haven't yet. Anyways, friends, I hope you'll be well until I see you next time. And until then, friends, bye-bye.